But our presentation tonight is discover how to get on and stay on the straight and narrow path. How to get on and stay on the straight and narrow path. Open your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation in the 12th chapter. Revelation chapter 12. Our presentation last night was God has a church on earth, no kidding. And we did our very best to communicate to you that God is not only calling people out of something, He's calling people into something. What is God calling people out of? Babylon. Babylon. That's exactly right. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Come out of her, my people. And of course, Babylon is the mother church, but you remember she has daughters, and those daughters are any church, any communion that have residual elements of paganism or papalism bound up with their various teachings. And so God says, come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. And so here in Revelation chapter 12, and last night we asked the question, God is calling us out of something, but what is he calling us into? He not only shows us the exit sign, he shows us the entrance sign. And so in Revelation chapter 12, we pick it up in verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a what everyone? a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So I want you to notice that she is clothed with the sun and the stars and she has under her feet the moon. Those are the three things that God gave in the opening chapters of Genesis to bring light to this world. To bring what, everyone? Light. And so thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so this true church, these true people, would be spreading and illuminating this dark, dark world with the gospel truth. Verse 2. Then being with child, she cried out in pain and in, uh, in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red what, everyone? dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was what born, born. and who would that child be everyone Jesus, of course, in verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And so this woman here represents the true people of God. If you would like to use the word church, that's fine. But remember, of course, that Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a what, everyone? He was a Jew. Now, there's no question, as we've already discussed, that Jesus had to make a transition. Remember at the beginning of his ministry? Take these things hence. You have made my father's house a what? Den of thieves. But at the close of his ministry, behold, your house is left to you what? desolate. And so here we find this woman representing that transition period, always God's true people, but you could say the Jewish nation transitioning into the church. Verse 6, it says, then the woman fled into the what? Wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. That's the 1,260 prophetic days or literal years of papal persecution when basically there was only one show in town one show in town, and there wasn't many, many different churches. There was the church, and basically the church did not allow people access to the Bible, and uh, the Bible was kept away from people in the common language, etc., etc., and more or less you were told that if you didn't bow, if you didn't capitulate, if you insisted on standing on something other than what the, doc uh, the, uh, the, the, the cardinals were teaching and the priests were teaching and the others were teaching, you, you know, you could be uh, killed or you could be put into a dungeon or, or, or worse. And so many people fled this papal persecution, and that's exactly what we find there in Revelation chapter 12, is that the woman would flee. The woman would what, everyone? Flee. Now we jump down to verse 13, where we see this exact same imagery, identical imagery. It says, Now when the dragon saw that he would, was cast to the earth, I'm in verse 13, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great what, everyone? Eagle, that she might fly into the what? wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time times and half a time from the presence of the serpent there it is again identical situation God's true church fleeing from the face of the serpent fleeing from the face of Satan who was persecuting her verse 15 so the serpent spewed what out of his mouth water and water in Bible prophecy represents what people and so and so the devil basically joined the church you've heard the old saying if you can't beat them what do you do you join him. That's exactly right. And so he spewed water out of his mouth. That is people to try and basically infiltrate and infect the true church of God, many of whom were hiding up in the northern valleys of, of uh, northern Italy and other places, people like the Waldensians and the Huguenots and the Albigenses, God's true people, who insisted on standing on the word of God and refused to capitulate to the various papal dogmas and decrees, etc. If we're all on the same page, say amen. So we continue on here. It says in verse 16, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth. And what did it do, everyone? 
swallowed up the flood, and then it says, very interesting, swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And then verse 17, sort of the climax of Revelation chapter 12, and certainly the climax of the entire book of Revelation, right there in verse 17, it says, and the dragon was what? Wroth, or enraged with the woman, and went to make war with the rest of her seed, or if you have the King James, the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the what? testimony of Jesus. Now, I want you to remember way back, several meetings ago, probably 15 meetings ago, we looked at this war and we made this important point, and that is that the war, this great conflict, this great controversy, began where? In heaven, you remember, but where is it going to be finished? On earth, and that's exactly what we discover here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, is that when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, and we've already talked about that, he had some kind of limited access to heaven, but when he saw that he no longer had any access to heaven, he put all of his energies, all of his resources right here on planet earth to attack this remnant, this rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. To put it in very plain language, Satan's undiluted fury is being poured out upon God's true people at the end of time, if you believe that, say amen. And so, during the Dark Ages, God's church fled into the wilderness, as we have already said. Why did they flee to the wilderness? Because they had to. They had to flee to the wilderness, as we've already said. There was only one gig in town, only one church in town, and if you were unwilling to capitulate to the, to the various decrees and dogmas of the papal church, you had to flee. Uh, it was either fleeing or, or facing punishment or death or, or some other terrible situation. So in Revelation chapter 12, the woman was persecuted by Satan. We talked about this last night. Basically, during the period of the Dark Ages, as people were going through the Reformation, the what, everyone? The Reformation, God was leading His people step by step by step by step out of Rome. Are we all together, everyone? And we talked about this, how the Waldensians, they said the Bible and the Bible only. John Hess, Huss emphasized obedience. Martin Luther said the just shall live by what? Faith. And then he took that hammer and he nailed those 95 theses there to the door at Wittenberg. The hammer uh, uh, blows that were heard all around the world. John Calvin said Christian growth and God's sovereignty. The Anabaptists said it's not this sprinkling thing. And Scotty talked to us about that this morning. Baptism by immersion. John Wesley said holiness. He was referred to pejoratively by the, uh, 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 other, by the people that were his detractors as Methodists. But he actually took that term and he, he internalized it. He used it and they became known as the Methodists, even though originally it was actually a term of uh, derogatory term. William Miller with the Second Coming, the Advent Movement, the Sabbath, the Death and Health, 1800s to the present. Basically what you see here is that at different stages of coming out of Rome, many people, instead of continuing to march with truth, they set up their flag, they set up their banner, and they said, we're Lutherans, we're Calvinists, we're Presbyterians, we're Wesleyans, but truth was marching on. Can you say amen? And so what God is doing here is He is reforming. That's why it's called the Reformation. But He's not just reforming. He's restoring truth. Now, if that makes sense, I want you to say amen. Very, very interesting. And so here God is working, 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 bringing new truth, bringing new light, bringing new biblical insights. And then God opens up a whole new continent a whole new hemisphere, and the church, who, who basically, uh, uh, as we've already discussed there in Revelation chapter 12, was very much under the persecution of both uh, you know, um, the, the kings and the monarchs and others and the popes. And so to flee both religious tyranny and civil tyranny, they came to a new land. Can you say amen? And that's why when they got off of those boats, beloved, many of them got down on the ground and kissed the ground because they were coming to a new place where they could escape the tyranny of the popes and the tyranny of the kings, and they established a new government. They established a what, everyone? A new government. A government that did not have subjects, but what? Citizens. A government of the people, what? for the people and by the people. And they said, no, 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 no. Religion is going to be over here and the state is going to be over here and it's imperative that they stay separate because every single time in past experience when religion and state had gotten together, they proved to be very unhappy bed partners. And they set up a whole new radically... I mean, the American experiment, just do a little bit of research, was a radical experiment in civil and religious liberty. And God opened up this whole new continent so that His people who wanted to worship Him in spirit and in truth had a place to do it. Can you say amen? And of course, today, the United States of America is the front-runner of democracy. And not just the front-runner of democracy, it's the most powerful nation in the world. 
I mean, think about that for just a minute. The meteoric rise of the United States is unprecedented in the history of the human experience. I mean, in 200 short years, it goes from basically non-existent to being the single most powerful nation that the world has ever seen. Beloved, if you don't see the providence of God in that, you can't see the providence of God anywhere. Are, we, are you hearing me, yes or no? Absolutely incredible. So tonight we're talking about how to get on and stay on the narrow path. I believe that God has a church on earth. I believe that Jesus was telling the truth when he said in Matthew chapter 16 that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Can you say amen? Now I want to be crystal clear about something. God has his people in every church. Say amen if you believe that. Does God have faithful people in the Catholic church? Does God have faithful people in the Baptist church? Methodist church? Presbyterian church? Absolutely. God has his faithful people everywhere. But I believe in my heart of hearts that God also has an organization. And what did I say, everyone? An organization on earth that he can point to and say, those are my people. Are they perfect? No. Are they better? No. But are they living up to what the Bible teaches? I think the answer is yes. And beloved, I've told you before many, many, many times, don't go find a church that suits you and then hope they preach the Bible. Rather, find what the Bible teaches and then go find a church that teaches what the Bible teaches. Amen? Amen. People say, oh, but you're going to a cult. Beloved, let people say what they want to say. What other people think of me is none of my business. What I care about is what Jesus and God think of me. Can you say amen to that? Let people say what they want to say. They said Jesus was a Samaritan. They said Jesus was Beelzebub. They said Jesus was a wine-bibber. They said Jesus was a glutton. If there had been the internet and websites in the days of Jesus, he would have been taken to task by everybody. Amen and amen? So, beloved, I do believe that God does have a church on earth today, and I want to walk you through that. I want to tell you why I believe that, and I want to walk you through the identifying characteristics of God's church. Now, I, now I've made this already clear, but I want to say it again. That does not mean that I believe that these are the only people that are saved or that are going to heaven. C can you say amen to that? I mean, I don't know how I can say it any, uh, any more plainly. L let me just make it very, very clear. There are Baptists that, that are following the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, mind, and soul, and they are saved because they love the Lord Jesus. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. There are Methodists, the same, who love the Lord Jesus with all their heart, who love God, who want to serve God, and they're saved and they're going to heaven because they're living up to the light that they have. Is this clear, yes or no? Do I need to go down the list of every single denomination? Okay, so are we clear what Pastor Ashrick is saying? There's no question that God has His people in every church, in every communion, in every body of faith. That's not what's up for negotiation. So don't think for a moment that Pastor Asterix has said, because he hasn't said, and he never would say, that only members of his church are going to heaven. I don't believe it, I wouldn't believe it, and it's not biblical. What I do believe is that God will have a people on earth, an identifiable group of people on earth, who will be, to the best of their ability, living up to Bible truth. Now, my question for you tonight is, if that's true, and if there is a communion where God's people are trying their best by the grace of God to live up to the Word, is that a communion that you would be interested in joining? And if not, I'd say, why? And please don't tell me that you enjoy the donuts and the coffee hour at your local church. Please don't tell me that you love the organ and that your uncle paid for the stained glass window at your local church. Please don't tell me that. The only thing that would satisfy me and frankly the only thing that would satisfy the Lord Jesus is if you could say, my church follows the Bible more closely than your church. Incidentally, if that's true, I'll join your church. Because I'm not out to be an apologist for a church. I'm out to be an apologist for the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. Can you say amen? Okay, but here's the point. You've been coming to these meetings 24, 25, 26 nights, and we have not been saying, you got to come to our church. Our church is the true church. Our church is the only church. Have you heard me say that, yes or no? No way, haven't said it, wouldn't say it. But at the end of this thing, people are saying, well, where do you go to church? Where do you go to church? Where do you go to church? I mean, where do you fellowship? Where do you worship the Lord? Now listen, what would be weirder if at the end of the meetings, I said, you know, it's, you've really enjoyed coming. I've learned so much, Pastor Ashrick, and, and uh, you've been, been enjoying coming. Oh, I didn't know this, and I didn't know this, and I didn't know this, and praise God, I've never heard the word preached this way before. By the way, it's not because of a man, it's because of the Son of Man. Can you say amen? Now, what would be stranger if at the end of all that, they say, now listen, where do you fellowship? Yeah, I'd be real, where do you go to church? I'd be very interested to go where you go. And I'd say, you know, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> because this isn't about building up my church. It's, I'm not going to tell you. You'd say, what? Would that be weirder or would it be stranger for me to tell you, hey, listen, let me show you where I do go to church. Let me show you the organization that I do believe God is using on earth. Not the only organization. Not the what did I say, everyone? 
not the only organization, but definitely the one that I have found that is following the Bible most closely. Which would be stranger for me to tell you or not to tell you? Not to tell you. That would be, that would be downright odd. You'd say, are you kidding me? I mean, come on. Uh, no, I'm not going to tell you. You can twist my arm and I'll never tell you. I'm nev no, of course I'm going to tell you. Amen and amen? I believe God does have a church on earth today, and I've given you enough caveats. I think we can get through this. These are the identifying characteristics of God's true church. Number one, they have to recapture the original faith of the disciples. Can you say amen? They're called the remnant. Okay, remember the remnant is the last. It's the what, everyone? It's the last. And so the remnant has to look mostly like or exactly like the original. Has to look exactly like the original. If you were going to find a remnant of this fabric, it would have to be the same weight. It would have to be the same color. It would have to be the same pattern. It would have to be the same texture. It would have to be the same. Amen and amen. And so when we're looking for a church in the last days, we have to look for a church that's like the apostolic church. Does that make sense? We have to look for a church that will recapture the vision and the faith of the original church of the disciples. Number two, it would have the dual characteristics of keeping God's commandments and guidance by the, the gift of prophecy. Now you say, wait a minute, I didn't catch that last part. You're still in Revelation chapter 12. Look with me at verse 17. Revelation chapter 12. First of all, the commandments one is an easy one. That's a so-called no-brainer because we've been going over that night after night after night after night. But let's look at it again. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It says, And the dragon was what, everyone? Enraged with the who? Woman. And went to make what? War with the rest of her offspring who what? Keep the commandments of God. Is there any question in anyone's mind in this room that God's last day people will be keeping His commandments not in order to be saved, but because they are saved? I mean, look at beloved, that's Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. You can look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. In fact, why don't you do that since it's probably on the same page? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the what? The commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And so beloved, never forget this, that the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus go hand in hand. Can you say amen? Because Jesus saves. Isn't that true? But the question is, saves from what? I remember before I was a Christian, I'd see these bumper stickers all over the place, Jesus saves, or somebody be wearing a t-shirt, Jesus saves, and I used to think to myself, saves from what? Beloved, to tell somebody that Jesus saves before they first understand that they're lost is a nonsensical statement. Does that make sense? And so, in order for us to have the gospel, if we only have the gospel, it's like standing on one leg. We need the commandments of God to show us two things. Number one, God is righteous and we're unrighteous. Amen? Amen? That's the two great purposes of the law, to show us the righteousness, the infinite holiness of God, and to show us our own failings and our own shortcomings. And so the law is like a schoolmaster that leads us to who? Jesus. And so you need both. You need the gospel leg that saves you, and you need the law leg that shows you how to live and lead you to the Lord. Does that make sense, everyone? And so notice, God's last day people, they have the commandments of God, and they have the what? Faith of Jesus. And I want to say it again. An apple tree does not bear apples in order to be an apple tree. You get that? An apple tree does not bear apples in order to be an apple tree. An apple tree bears apples because it is an apple tree. Christians do not do good works in order to be saved. Christians do good works because they are saved. If that makes sense, say amen. See, this whole faith and works thing is not, it's not a mystery at all. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. But the faith which saves always works. Amen? Ah, that's a piece of cake. People talk about the, the strange subtleties and difficulties and nuances of faith and works. Are you kidding me? It's as plain as the noonday sun. You're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His life becomes your life. His substitutionary death is your death. You're saved by faith. Amen? And anybody who's been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ does not want to continue to live in that pathetic life of sin that they were called out of. They want to get victories in their life. They want to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to live for the glory of God. And that takes the power of the Spirit. Can you say amen? I mean, it's a piece of cake. So there should be no question in anyone's mind that God's last day people are going to keep His commandments, including the one commandment that the whole world has forgotten that begins with the word remember. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. You might as well look at it since you're so close. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. How many people here tonight want to go to the New Jerusalem? Raise your hand if you think you're going, I want to go to the New Jerusalem. Me too. Look at Revelation 22, 14. It says, Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the what? 
The city. Are those people that enter the city going to be keeping God's commandments? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. In order to be saved? Because they are saved. You're a student. Back to Revelation chapter 12. So one of the identifying characteristics is that they would keep the commandments of God. But look at that second one there. Kind of interesting. Revelation chapter 12, it says in verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which, let's all say it together, which keep the commandments of God, and notice this, and have the testimony of Jesus. Well, what's the testimony of Jesus? Someone says, the testimony of Jesus is testifying about Jesus. And you're right, mostly. Let me show you what the Bible says the testimony of Jesus is. Is that a good idea, everyone? So you're still there in Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, and notice with me verse 10. And here we find an exact grammatical verbal equivalence. We're trying to ask, ask, ask and answer the question, what is the testimony of Jesus? Because that's one of the identifying characteristics of God's last day people. They keep the commandments of God and they have the, let's say it together, the testimony of Jesus. I'm in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. John here sees an angel and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, no, 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 no. See that thou do it not. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of what? Jesus. There it is again. That's the same phrase. Now watch what the angel says. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you see that, everyone? I mean, it's just as plain as the noonday sun. The angel said it. Pastor Asherick didn't say it. The testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit of prophecy. And so God's last day people, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, have the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. And the angel tells us the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay? So it will keep God's commandments. It will have guidance by the gift of prophecy. I'm going to come back to that one. Number three, it has to be a worldwide mission-driven movement. Some little church cannot pitch up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and say they're the remnant church of God because the church, and, and they could be in Tuscaloosa, but they can't be only in Tuscaloosa, and here's why. This message that this church is going to be preaching has to go to every nation and every kindred and every tongue and every people. It's got to be a worldwide church. You, you might have your nice little church over in Sterling Heights that you love the donuts and the stained glass window and the organ. Well, good for you. Are, are you reaching people outside of Sterling Heights? Is that an important question? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, does God love people in Sterling Heights more than the rest of the world? No, 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 no. So we're looking for a church that's a worldwide mission-driven movement. Can you say amen? amen? By the way, as soon as you say worldwide church, if you want to talk about true churches, that is uh, uh, groups that are not classified by some as cults, you only got two options. Do you hear what I said? You only got two options. The moment that you decide that the Bible teaches it has to be a worldwide church, you got two choices. Now, if you want to talk about groups that some would label as cults, and I would agree with that, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, I'm not even including those because those are considered uh, so non-orthodox that the majority of people wouldn't call them churches anyway. Not to say that there are not good people in those communions. Can you say amen? No question about that. But if you're just going to talk about churches, that is churches that are accepted by the, you know, the, the, the mass populace as being churches that are worldwide, you've got two options. How many? Two. I challenge you to look through this. You know what your first option is? The Catholics. That's exactly right. They are a worldwide, they are, a, they are all over the globe, they're a worldwide church. And you've got another option. And that's the option I'm going to tell you about here in just a little minute. It happens to be the church that I'm a member of. Look at number four. This church will call people to a total commitment to Christ. Can you say amen? Absolutely. It's not going to be this, you know, I'm a religious person on Sunday morning, and then I go home to watch the football games, and I leave my religious self back at the church. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean, and I want to be strong on this, that does not mean that everybody who's a member of the church that I consider to be God's last day church is got all their cards in a row and all their ducks lined up and that they're all spirit filled. Uh-uh. You can find bad people in every church and you can find good people in every church. Someone say amen. amen. But we're talking as a system. The call would be to a total commitment to Christ. I don't want to stand up here and say, oh, look at my fancy car. My car's prettier than your car. My dad could beat up your dad. My church is better than your church. On that, no, 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 it's not about that. Can you say amen? 
has nothing to do with that. What we're looking for is a body of believers who are trying by the grace of God to cling to the word in its entirety and to prepare a people for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. Are we saying that every person in that church is perfect? Not even close. Are we saying that every person in that church is absolutely, you know, just exactly what you would expect to find? No, 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 we're not saying that. What we are saying is that it's an organization and organizations are made up of people and not everybody is perfect. Someone say amen. Okay, here we go. Number five, that this organization is clearly going to have to lead people back to the Bible Sabbath. Why? Because we've been studying that. The whole Mark of the Beast issue, the whole United States and Bible prophecy issue centers around this, this whole big picture of God's commandments versus the traditions of men. God's commandments versus the rules and dogmas and decrees of men. And so whoever this last day church is, they have got to be keeping God's Sabbath and not the mark of Rome's ecclesiastical authority. If that makes sense, say amen. Now think of it this way. Somebody said to me one time, well, how do I know what church to go to? I mean, it would take me so long. You know, if I open up the phone book and I started with the CH, you know, church, and I'm going to go to this church and 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 to go find God's remnant church. I'm going to go find God's true church. Beloved, you know what? You know what? You can, you, you can basically make your task infinitely easier by just going through all of the churches that don't keep the Sabbath and discarding them. Does that make sense? Now, am I saying that that doesn't mean that God doesn't have his people there? Am I saying that? God has his people in there. But beloved, if God's last day church is going to be leading people to the biblical Sabbath, then all you have to do is start going through and looking for the churches that are keeping the biblical Sabbath, not the papal Sabbath. Amen. Does that make sense? And so you go through and that's going to reduce your list by about 90%. Are you with me, everyone? I mean, that's good. your job just got infinitely easier right there. Now, let's continue on here. Number six, it would encourage people to, give, uh, to live healthy lives spiritually, socially, mentally, and physically. Can you say amen? amen? Absolutely. That's what we saw there in Revelation chapter 14. The first angel's message is fear God and what? Give glory to Him. And uh, Paul says there in 1 Corinthians, he says, Therefore, whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, do how much to the glory of God? do everything to the glory of God. And so these people would be spiritually healthy, socially healthy, mentally healthy, and physically healthy, a call to give our lives, our bodies back to God. This is what I like to call it. It's the gospel lifestyle. Can you say amen? amen. Beloved, if you're a Christian, it should impact every aspect of your life. As somebody has said one time, if you were accused in a court of law of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? You follow? If you're a Christian, somebody ought to be able to look at your checkbook and know. Woo! If you're a Christian, somebody should be able to go to your, even your cupboards and be able to tell. Somebody should be able to go through your library and know if you're a Christian. Come on now. Yeah. Beloved, it's a lifestyle. There's so many of us, we have this little compartmentalized view of what it means to be a Christian. Oh, this is where I'm a religious person over here on Sunday morning or Saturday morning. And, and now I'm no, I, I leave my religious person at church. I don't want him or her to get dirty. And then I go out for the rest of my life and I'm, who the, I'm, I'm my normal, regular self. No. The gospel lifestyle says I'm a Christian 24-7. I live for the glory of God all the time. Amen. Amen. Whew, I tell you, I'm never going to finish this. <laughs> now look at this. Must arise after 1798. And you're saying, what? what? How could that be? How can you say that the church has to arrive after, arise after 1798? It's actually a piece of cake. Remember that God's true church goes into hiding, into the wilderness for 1,260 years. That 1,260 years begins in 538, ends in 1798. And so basically, the true church comes out of hiding. God's true faithful come, people come out of hiding after the time of papal persecution. Does that make sense? So basically what we're looking for, because if the woman is in the wilderness from 538 to 1798, if the woman is in the wilderness for the 1,260 years of papal persecution, we really can't look for this woman to come on the scene as a prominent figure until after that time. Everybody following me? It's actually pretty simple. Right there in Revelation chapter 12. And this church would make a final appeal to accept what? Truth. And I can tell you, beloved, that all over the world, and I'm not overemphasizing when I say that, all over the world, I want to say it again, all over the what? World, people are preaching meetings exactly like the meetings you have been attending for the last 20-some nights. 
So we're looking for all of these different identifying characteristics. All of these different what, everyone? Identifying characteristics. And if we find those identifying characteristics, I'm going to venture a guess, I'm going to hazard a guess that we're going to find God's church. I believe that with my whole heart. I'm transparent and I'm not going to, there's no hidden agenda with me. I'll tell you everything right up front. And I'm going to tell you this right up front. I believe that God has raised up someone in the last days who he has given the gift of prophecy. I want you to know I believe that. Now, that should make you nervous. I'm going to be totally honest. That should make you nervous. Because Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 24 about false prophets and false Christs that would arise and deceive many. So if somebody came to me and said, hey, listen, there's somebody who I believe has the gift of prophecy. My initial reaction is total skepticism. Can you say amen? If that's not your initial reaction, you, 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 you need to check yourself. Your initial reaction should be total skepticism, but you should be open to see. Does that make sense? Because when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, beware of false prophets, I want you to notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, beware of all prophets. If Jesus knew that there was never going to be any true prophets down to the end of time, what he would have said is, beware of anybody who claims to be a prophet. But the very fact that he said beware of false prophets demonstrates that he knew there would be some true, but you'd have to sort through all of the rubbish in order to find what's true. As John says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Now, I'm going to share something with you tonight that is absolutely, totally awesome. The gift of prophecy is the only gift of the Spirit that occurs in all three New Testament lists of spiritual gifts. There are three lists. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4. That's it. Those are all the lists of spiritual gifts the Apostle Paul talks about. And you, you know some of the gifts, the gift of tongues, the gift of discernment, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of prophecy, etc. But there is only one gift that occurs in all three lists, and that's the gift of prophecy. Okay? Unquestionably the most preeminent, and we're going to actually talk a little bit more about this and especially the issue of tongues in a future night. So, look at this. Historically, God has set the precedent of raising up prophets to foretell the soon occurrence of a major event. A major event. That's a biblical precedent that God has established, and I want to try and show that to you. Amos chapter 3, verse 7, God says, or Amos speaking on behalf of God says, Surely the Lord God does how much? Nothing unless He reveals His secrets to His servants. What? The prophets. In other words, God's not trying to do things over in a corner to hope you don't find out. God sends his prophets so that you can find out, and they're available all through the Old and the New Testament if we're willing to hear the voice of God. Can you say amen? amen. Powerful. Man, I wish I, had to, I just got to keep going. Okay, here we go. So, God raised up a man named Noah to foretell the coming flood. Are you with me, everyone? God raised up a man named Noah. Incidentally, who was the oldest man in the Bible that ever lived? No. The oldest man that ever lived was Enoch. The oldest man that ever died was what? Methuselah. Gotcha. The name Methuselah means, listen to this, the name Methuselah actually means when he dies, it will come. That's what the name means. When he dies, it will come. That's the name Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969 years. Have you ever wondered why did he live so long? Because his name, his name, and he, he himself was basically a prophecy of the coming flood. When he dies, it will come. When he dies, it will come. And God is holding back the winds of strife. God is holding back the winds of, of uh, adversity that are going to come. God knows the flood is coming. He raised up Noah and he said, I'm not going to always put up with this stiff-necked, obstinate people. And so he lets this man, Methuselah, live. Not, I mean, he lives, Jared, the, you know, Adam lives 930 and he bypasses Adam. He was getting to be an old man, and a man named Jared lived to be 962, and he, he lives right past that. And he goes all the way to 969, and in the year he died, the flood came. God raised up Noah to foretell that when Methuselah died, it would come. So there was that prophecy, when he dies, it will come. God raises up Noah and says, God's not kidding. It's going to come. So before a major event, God raised up who, everyone? He raised up Noah. And then there was another time prophecy. God gave it to Abraham. He basically said, your children, your descendants are going to be in Egypt for 400 years. They're going to be in Egypt for how long? 400 years. And that time prophecy went, 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 went. And just as that time prophecy was about ready to come to a close, God raised up a prophet to go get, because the, the time prophecy was being fulfilled. Who did he raise up? That's right. He raised up Moses. That's exactly right. God raised up Moses before the exodus of God's people. 
So there was the time prophecy. It goes forward. God raises up a prophet. Why? To foretell the end of the time prophecy and to get people ready for a major event. A man by the name of Jeremiah. He prophesied that Israel would be in Babylonian captivity for how many years? Seventy years. Okay? And then God raised up another prophet to foretell the coming of the end of the 70 years. Who was that? Daniel, that's exactly right. God raised up Daniel to foretell the end of the 70 years. Then Daniel foretold uh, the, the 70 year, pardon me, the 70 week prophecy, 490 years. And that prophecy extended all the way down until the coming of the Messiah. Can you say amen? Remember that? 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression all the way through. And then he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince shall be 69 weeks. So here's this prophecy that the Messiah is going to come. And who, who did God raise up to foretell the finishing of that prophecy? Of course, John the Baptist, absolutely. God raised up John the Baptist to announce the coming of Christ. And so in every instance you have here, Methuselah, God raises up Noah and says the prophecy is coming to an end. Abraham, God raises up Moses to say the time prophecy is coming to an end. Jeremiah, God raises up Daniel to say the time prophecy is coming to an end. Daniel has the prophecy, God raises up John the Baptist to say the time prophecy is coming to an end. If this makes sense, say amen. You see what God is doing? God here has a timeline and he's not saying, well, I'm going to keep it from you, you know. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo, try and figure it out. What God is saying is, it's right here. It's for you. I'm showing you through my prophets. This is my plan of action for the earth. Powerful. To announce the coming of Christ. Historically, God has raised the precedent of setting up prophets to foretell the soon occurrence of a major event. Now, this is especially true when a major time prophecy is involved, as we've already said. We should expect that God will utilize the gift of prophecy in the last days. And I'm going to give you several reasons to believe that. In other words, if we discover today that God does in fact have someone on earth who is a prophet, we shouldn't say, oh, I can't believe it. I just, I can't believe it. Beloved, why not? Why couldn't you believe it? Number one, we've already seen that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that the last day people would keep the commandments of God and have the what? testimony of Jesus. But the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we should be expecting it. In fact, look in Joel chapter 2. Look in Joel. That's the Old Testament. See if you can find it there. Minor prophets toward the end of the Old Testament. You might get there before me. Joel chapter 2. See if you can find it just after Hosea. Joel chapter 2. What chapter, everyone? Joel chapter 2. And here we go in verse 28. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Is everyone there? Amen. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on how much flesh? On all flesh. Now look at this. Your sons and your daughters will what? Prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also upon my men servants and upon my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in what? In those days. You say, well, which are those days? Look at verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and what? Awesome day of the Lord. What is the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord? Yeah, that's the second coming of Jesus. In fact, if you look at that language there, blood and, and fire and pillars of smoke, that's judgment language. This is a direct reference to the second coming of Jesus. And Joel says that he's going to raise up his sons and his daughters and men servants and maid servants who will dream dreams and prophesy just before the coming of the Lord. So tonight, if we discover that God has raised up a prophet, we shouldn't say, what? I can't believe it. We should say, I expect it. Now, I'm going to give you a third reason here to believe that the devil is no dummy. You say amen to that? Amen. See, the moment that you talk about a prophet, everybody gets immediately skeptical. You know why? Because of false prophets. Right? When somebody told me, yeah, there's somebody on earth that I think is a prophet, the first thing I thought of was Joseph Smith. Right? Like I'm immediately skeptical because I know that there have been false prophets that have come on the scene. You, is this making sense, everyone? See, now think about this for just a minute. Have you ever seen a counterfeit $97 bill? Can you imagine that? Do you know why you've never seen a counterfeit $97 bill? There's no real one. So if the devil is going to start raising up false prophets, and Joseph Smith is not the only one, and I have no problem saying, by the way, that the man was a false prophet. No question. If the devil is going to start raising up false prophets, why is he doing that? Because he wants to muddy the waters because he knows that God is going to raise up a true prophet. 
And that way when you come to the church and you say, hey, listen, I want to tell you something. There's this person who I think has the gift of prophecy. And you say, yeah, right. Been there, done that. But beloved, we can, we have to, if, if we come to any prophet, here's prophet A, prophet B, prophet C, prophet D, prophet E. We can't just say they're all false prophets because what if one is the real deal? Does that make sense? I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to turn our back on, a, on an Ezekiel. We don't want to turn our back on a Jeremiah. We don't want to turn our back on the John the Baptist. I mean, Israel did that. We don't want to commit the, so how are we going to know? How would we know? Well, let me tell you how you wouldn't know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't ask for a burning in the bosom, right? That's what one of the Mormon missionaries said to me. They said, oh, you know, Joseph Smith is a true prophet. And if you pray and ask God to give you a burning in the bosom, you'll know too. Well, let me tell you something. I'm not going to trust my gastrointestinal system to determine whether or not a prophet is a true one of God. And I'm not saying that to make fun. I mean, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Amen. I mean, I might pray and, and my heart is so deceitful and, and desperately wicked that I might really want my bosom to burn. And so, yeah, I think I felt something and I would question or maybe I ate too many Doritos or too much ice cream. And before I know it, I've got a burning in the bosom and I'm duty bound to believe that this guy's a false prophet, a prophet rather, even though so much of what he said contradicts the Bible. So how would I know? Come on, tell me, help me. How would you know? Here's prophet A, B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, are they all false prophets? I'd go to the Bible, wouldn't I? I'd go to the Bible, wouldn't I? I'd go to the Bible. And if I'm going down and uh, he says this and I say, mm, eh, you know, whammy, rah, out. And go down and listen to this guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so far, so good. Eh, whammy, you're out. Go down, listen to this guy. Yeah, yeah. Eh, whammy, you're out. I mean, it would be very easy to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they don't speak according to this, they're out. Now, think about that for just a minute. You've never seen a counterfeit $97 bill. Why? Because there's no real $97, $97 bill. And the devil, I believe in my heart of heart of heart of hearts, that the devil has started raising up all of these false prophets to muddy the waters so that if someone did come on the scene, the vast majority of Christians would be so nervous about the whole concept, they'd say, no, 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 not interested. But beloved, if we did that, we would only be given the devil the victory. What if God has raised up somebody to give us a special message at the end of time? Is, it, is what I'm saying making sense? Does it sound rational? Does it sound reasonable? Yeah, yeah I hope so. I, I hope it does because it is. It 100% is. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his servants, his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amos chapter 3, verse 7, as we've already said. False prophets will be raised up in the last days. Is that true? Yes or no? Well, how do you know a false prophet? Right there from the word. Amen? Makes good sense, okay? Edgar Cayce, the so-called sleeping prophet, the life prophecies and readings of America's most famous mystic, false prophet. How do I know he's a false prophet? He doesn't exalt Jesus and he doesn't keep the law. He has nothing to do with the word. He's a false prophet. I don't care if he gets 97% of his predictions right. All that tells me is that the devil knows the future pretty well, or at least he's a good guesser. Okay? And this woman here, uh, the phenomenal Jean Dixon, she was accurate 30 to 60% of the time. One million copies sold. It's you know, a gift of prophecy. Listen, 30, 30 to 60% isn't going to cut it because God knows the future 100% of the time. That, it makes sense, everyone? Okay, I hope we're all on the same page here. Psychics, horoscopes, palm readers, and others are all types of false prophets, and, and we are flooded with them. How can we be sure that someone who claims to be a prophet is a true prophet? Well, we'd go to the Word. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, Jeremiah 28, verse 9, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as the one whom the Lord has truly sent. So, if God raises up a prophet and what they say comes to pass, that would indicate that this could, in fact, be a true prophet of God. Deuteronomy chapter 13, 1 and 2. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. Notice this. You shall what? Not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. Did you follow that? In other words, if somebody raises up and they say, this certain event is going to happen and it happens, but then they say, you don't have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to honor the Lord Jesus. True, true prophet, false prophet. False prophet. Because even though the prediction may have come right, if they don't speak according to the word, they're out. Okay, so we're beginning to see tests 
We're seeing what, everyone? Tests that can help. God is a rational, logical, reasonable God. Can you say amen? amen? He doesn't ask you to believe without giving you sufficient evidence upon which to base your belief. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Some people think that Christianity is all about a blind leap into the darkness. I hope it's not that. Beloved, when I come to the church, I don't want to have to check my brain at the door. Amen? amen? And when I became a Christian, I didn't say, well, here we go. Ah! Are you with me? I, I, I didn't just jump and hope for the best. I walked through it. I said, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And all the while, the Spirit of God is leading. His Word is leading. And God is a logical God. Sometimes He does things that we don't understand, but He doesn't do things that are just off the charts illogical. Can you say amen? And so, yeah, mm-hmm, got it, mm-hmm, got it, mm-hmm, got it. And that's one of the things that appeals to me about the Bible is that the Bible is an intelligent book written for intelligent people. Amen? And people have this misconception idea that, you know, Christians are crazy people and they don't, they don't think and etc. Et Nothing could be further from the truth. The God of the Bible invented your mind. The God of the Bible invented logic. The God of the Bible invented intelligence. He's given you a mind. He expects you to use it. And He expects you to reason through uh, in a very logical, linear fashion. Can you say amen? amen? That doesn't mean that everything is strictly logical. Of course not. But it's consistent with logic, and that's the point. Whoo! Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a what? In a vision, and I will speak to him in a what? Dream. That's exactly right. Nothing wrong with that. So here are biblical tests of a true prophet. Prophetic accuracy. Amen. Biblical faithfulness. Amen. Exalt who? Listen, I don't want to have anything to do with any Nostradamus figure or anybody else who just gets things right occasionally but doesn't lift up Jesus. If they don't lift up Jesus, eh, you're out. You get the whammy if you don't lift up Jesus. Commandment keeping would have to be commandment keeping. All of God's prophets kept the commandments. Listen, if somebody tells you not to keep the commandments of God, if somebody tells you not to surrender to the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, if somebody tells you that you don't need to study your Bible, I don't care what they say, they're a false prophet. And so a true prophet would exalt Jesus. A true prophet would keep God's commandments. A true prophet, there are various physical tests that we didn't go over here. A true prophet would show spiritual fruit. Amen? So if we have all of those, if the gift of, prophes the gift of prophecy is the only gift that, is, uh, that occurs in all three New Testament lists, as we've already said. Tonight, I want to be crystal clear about what I am saying, what I'm not saying. Here's what I'm saying. I believe God has a church on earth. I believe that with all of my heart. And I've already said it a million, zillion, trillion times that that does not mean that those are the best people or the only people that are going to heaven. Say amen. I mean, I can't say it more strongly than I have. If somebody goes out of here and misunderstands that point, it's because they want to misunderstand that point. Here's the second thing I want to say. I do believe that amidst all of the trash that the devil has raised up, amidst all of the confusion that the devil has raised up, amidst all of that that Satan has raised up, I believe that there is a gem in the mud. Amen. I believe that. I believe that. And that book that you have in your hand right there, that book that you have in your hand right there, is actually the second most translated book in the world. No joke. In fact, you know what the first most translated book in the world is? It's that book right there. This book that you hold in your hand right here is actually a, a, a different title for a book called Steps to Christ. The second most translated book in the world, and it was written by Ellen White. Here's all I'm going to say to you. Read the book and ask one question. Just ask one question. Does it lead me closer to Jesus? If the answer is yes, then love it. If the answer is no, then discard it and don't worry about it because you still got the Bible. Is that reasonable, yes or no? I think that's very, very, very reasonable. Someone says, well, wait a minute. Can a woman, can a woman have this gift? I mean, can a woman... Does God discriminate? No. no, look at this. Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and he stayed with him. Now this man had four what? Virgin daughters who what? Prophesied. prophesied. Can a woman prophesy? Yeah, no problem. God's not, God's not against that. He, he doesn't mind that. A woman by the name of Ellen White, she was 17 years old, and God raised her up, and she became a very powerful writer, a very powerful health educator, uh, an a, uh, uh, education educator, and others. That is to say, she wrote on pedagogical theory and other things. The ministry of Ellen G. Pedagog I'm talking crazy language here. She wrote about how to get a good education. How's that? The ministry of Ellen G. White, she received more than 2,000 prophetic visions and dreams. She wrote over 50 books, and she lectured, lectured to thousands on th three continents. In fact, she is the, she is, this is actually quite an amazing fact, she is the most authored female nonfiction author in the world. 
She's the most authored nonfiction female author in the world. In the world, ever. In the history, in the history of, in the history. Look at this. This is what Paul Harvey said. He's a huge fan of Ellen White's. Huge fan. In fact, a good friend of mine is a good friend of Paul Harvey's. And uh, he spends a lot of time with Paul. And uh, he, anyway, I could tell you some stories, but I'm not going to do that because this is being recorded. Paul Harvey said on live radio, September 25th, 1997, women have been honored on American postage stamps for more than 100 years. By the way, Paul Harvey is, is, they've taken survey after survey after survey after survey, and they have shown that Paul Harvey is the single most trusted person in the American media. Did you know that? The single, consistently the single most trusted person in the American media. Why? Because he's a straight shooter. Isn't that true? He just tells you like it is. This is, what's, this is the way it is. He said, women have been honored on postage stamps for more than 100 years, starting with one woman who was not an American, Queen Isabella, in 1893. Since then, 86 women have been honored, ranging from Martha Washington to Marilyn Monroe. He goes on. Also, many women authors like Louisa May Alcott, Emily Dickinson, Willie Cather, and Rachel Carson. He says, I can name an American woman author who has never been honored thus, though her writings have been translated into 148 languages, more than Marx or Tolstoy, more than Agatha Christie, more than William Shakespeare. Only now is the world coming to appreciate her recommended prescription for optimum spiritual and physical health. Ellen White. Paul Harvey said, Ellen White? You don't know her? Get to know her. That's what Paul Harvey said, beloved. And, and he's not a member of my church. He's just somebody who's read the writings and said, yeah, it, it makes sense. It makes sense what she says. This is from the librarian at the library, uh, one of the official librarians at the Library of Congress. And as you know, every single book that's published in the United States has to go to the Library of Congress. This is what he said. He was asked, what's the best book that's ever been written apart from the Bible on the life of Christ? Best book ever. And this is what he said. My preference or choice would be guided by what I wish to get from the book or books to be read, but let me put it this way. I would put The Desire of Ages by Ellen G. White first for spiritual discernment and practical application. This was him speaking on her book entitled The Desire of Ages. Okay, you can read that book. It's about 800 pages, and I'll tell you this. You read that book, and there is no question that you will come away with a deeper love relationship with your Lord. I guarantee it. And if you find one thing in there that doesn't square with the Bible, then you tell me about it and throw it out because I want to know so I can throw it out. I've read the book through three or four times. It just absolutely, totally magnifies the Word and magnifies the Bible. Incredible. And listen, I'm not, am I telling you to take my word for it? Am I doing that? Not at all. I'm saying test it. That's what the Bible says. Test all things and see what's true. Look at this one. This is what she said in that book that I read. That's the book. This is the book that I read. Okay. In our time, this is page 204, in our time there is a wide departure from the doctrines, from their doctrines and precepts, and there is a need of return to the great Protestant principle, the Bible, and the Bible what? Only as the rule of faith and duty. See, so, beloved, for me it's all about the fruit. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. I read that book, I read 200 pages of that book, and the very next morning I went and bought a Bible. Does that make sense? In other words, it wasn't like, oh, well, the Bible is not properly translated. I mean, how many of you have heard that garbage before? People come knock on your door and you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, well the Bible says this, and the Bible says this, and the Bible says that. And they'll say, well, the, as far as the Bible is properly translated, you need another book. And they give you this other book. No, beloved. If you, the moment you tell me that the Bible is not properly translated, the moment that you tell me that this has to be corrected by another book, game over. I'm not interested. Amen? Totally disinterested immediately. You're not going to find any of that garbage. Look at this. The Bible and the Bible only is the rule of faith and study. Continue on here very quickly. Ellen White actually said in her book, The Ministry of Healing, that's a fascinating book on the, the miracles of Jesus, the healing miracles of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. She said, tobacco is a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. Now, let me tell you something. She said that at about the turn of the century. You see that word malignant? Do you know how long it took the, the, the American Medical Association doctors to figure out that, cancer, that smoking was cancerous? About 60 years later, they figured it out. How did she know? I believe she knew because God revealed it to her. In fact, if you read her counsels on health, very simple, simple, practical counsels on health, she says things like, you should eat a meat that's high in fibers, high in fresh fruits and vegetables, high in uh, nuts and grains and legumes, high in all of those kinds of things, and you should watch your diet and be sure you're not consuming too much meat. Does that, does that sound familiar at all? Yes or no? Now you're sitting there thinking, oh, of course, we've been hearing that for the last 10 years. You're exactly right. You've been hearing it for maybe the last 10 or 20 years, but you know what? She was saying it in the mid-1800s. Totally revolutionary, totally cutting edge. Incredible stuff. 
Absolutely incredible. This is what she said in her book, Gospel Workers. Look at this. Lift up what? Lift up Jesus, you that teach the people. I've done my very best in these seminars to lift up Jesus. I don't know if I failed or succeeded, but that's what I've been trying to do. I'm not trying to lift up myself. I'm trying to lift up the Lord Jesus. You have to be the judge of whether or not I've succeeded. And if I have succeeded, I haven't succeeded. The Lord has succeeded. Lift up Jesus, you that teach the people. Lift him up in sermon, in song, in prayer. Let all your powers be directed in pointing souls, confused, bewildered, lost to the who? Lamb of God. Lamb of God. By their fruits you shall know them. And I can tell you this, this book that you hold in your hands right here, this little book entitled Steps to Christ, this book has led hundreds of thousands of people to faith in Jesus. Amen. Hundreds of thousands of people to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. I should know, I was one of them. I mean, this book has played a huge role in my life in giving me a closer, clearer, more biblical conception of Jesus. And let me tell you this, the devil is not going to raise up a false prophet that's going to lead millions or hundreds of thousands of people to come to Jesus. Does that make sense? That's totally counterproductive to his cause. If the devil raises up a false prophet, that false prophet will say things like, well, the Bible, you know, only as far as it's properly translated and all of these doctrines that are crazy and off the wall. No, 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 no. Revelation chapter 12, does God have a church on earth? I believe he does. And I want you to know that, that I, I believe in my heart of hearts that this church on earth is not perfect, but it is an organization that God is working through in a marvelous, wonderful end time way. I'm putting all the cards out on the table. I believe this with my heart of hearts, but I want to be clear about several things here. Number one, and this is a conclusion that I have come to through my study of the Word, and don't take my word for it. You have to come to the same conclusion through your study of the Word. Okay? Tonight I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian for one reason, because I keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. Are we together on that one? And I believe in the advent of Jesus. That's what it means, Seventh-day Adventist. Okay? I believe that Jesus is coming soon. I believe the Sabbath is important. I believe that with my whole heart. And that's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Somebody's going to say, oh, he's a member of a cult. Let him say what they want to say. Amen? Amen? Who cares what people say? Who cares what people say about you? You be truthful to the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something in closing. You can go on the Internet. You can look up Seventh-day Adventist. And you're going to find people that say we're crazy, we're off the wall, we're this, we're that. Hey, listen, it's out there. You can find it. Okay, but let me tell you something else. You can also go on the Internet and find satanic child molesters. You can go on the internet and find people that think that Jesus was gay. You can go on the internet and find all kinds of terrible, ridiculous trash. The internet is not the test of truth. Can you say amen? amen? The internet is not the test of truth. You can find any wacko can get a website and say whatever he wants to say. Isn't that true? Yeah. And, and sometimes people put the worst configuration on things. I mean, think of it this way. I, I get nervous even talking to the media sometimes because the media can put things in such a way that it automatically makes the person guilty. For example, if somebody came up to me and said, Pastor Ashrick, is it true or not true that you had an affair on your wife and that you're embezzling money from the church? I'd say, no, that's not true. Headline reads, Pastor Ashrick denies adulterous affair and laundering of money. <laughs> are, are you following what I'm saying? So, beloved, it's all in the way that you communicate it. What I'm going to tell you, I think this is so reasonable, so totally reasonable. Number one, stick with the Bible. A hundred, I mean, night by night in these sermons, you've heard us preach what? The Bible. the Bible, period. The Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. But people have said to me, well, Pastor, how have you learned? I mean, in nine short years, how have you learned so much of what you, how do you know so much of what you know? I'll tell you, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's through the Bible, and I believe in my heart of hearts, it's through reading these writings that, that God has raised up this woman to give us that actually illumine the Word in a way that I've never seen before. When I picked up this book, and I read this book, I was driven immediately to the Bible. Amen. And I was driven immediately to Jesus. And I was driven immediately to surrender everything to the Lord Jesus Christ. By, by their fruits you shall know them. If you've gotten anything out of these meetings, this is what I want you to get. God's Word is true. God's, worthy is, God's Word is trustworthy. God, God's Word is reliable. Jesus is the only Savior. You're not saved by your works. You're saved by Jesus. That, that, that there's going to be a change in the Sabbath, that that change has happened, that God is raising up a people, that Babylon has fallen. I mean, the whole list goes down. And basically the bottom line is, check it out for yourself in your Word, in the Word of God.